Isaiah chapter 6. <clears throat> Sometimes when we go through inexplicable things, we don't realize how important our fellowship with the Lord is until you really need to get a hold of Him. So I got to looking at a passage we've looked at many times before just to sort of tiptoe through the passage from an expository standpoint to see whether or not I was willing to do my part in order to have that kind of a meeting with the Lord. Sometimes when we go to the Lord, it's as if we think we deserve an answer. We think we deserve a meeting with God. I think every time we come to church, we got a mindset that because we're here, God should show up. I think we oftentimes take for granted when God does show up. And maybe sometimes his absence make us grow a little bit more fond of not taking it for granted when he comes by to see us, whether it's through a song or whether it's through a sermon or even a word of prayer. Isaiah here has not ceased to go to church. You don't want to get that impression. But something had to get out of the way in order for him to be able to see the Lord. I don't know what stands between you and seeing the Lord today. I know this, He wants to be seen. He's not playing hide and seek. He's not trying to be difficult to find. He's interested not just in saving lost people that are going to hell, but in helping His children down the road. But too often we let other things get between us and the Lord. Sometimes even tears can wave such a veil that we're unable to see the Lord because of our own sorrow and grief. Isaiah says in verse number 1 of the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and His train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face and with twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that crieth, the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Brother Larry, Amen. take us to the throne room, please. Father Lord, we're, we're grateful, Lord, to be here. We're, we're thankful already for what we've heard and what you've given us and we're glad Lord that you and us makes us different from this world but everything else is uh, gone to the side Lord we, we have you and we have as much of you as we desire through fellowship to walk so we're grateful for that yes and then we find ourselves in this hour in church and we give you the glory, Lord, for the desire to be in church. And it's not our willingness necessary, Lord, our want to, but Lord, you've given us a place to come to. You've given us a preacher, a pastor, a teacher, and uh, someone to hear the Word of God taught and preached through. And we lift him up for you this morning. Pray God you'd use him in a mighty way. Remembering in that that you, you've set the platform already through song. Oh Lord, your, your grace, your mercy has found us. And as our sister sang, Lord, we're not ashamed of telling anybody that we can hide in Thee. In that cleft. So Lord, we hide in Thee this morning and ask You for, our, for help for us through Your Word. Thank you for the mightiness of your word, Lord, as it comes forth. Please be with our hearts. Help us to put flesh to the side and, and the things that may uh, be on our minds in the hours ahead. 
but to dwell on your word in this hour. Be with your man. I pray you would preach him in a mighty way. We remember those that are listening now that are not, open, not able to be here. And we'll give you all the glory, every bit of the glory, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Isaiah in the Bible is considered to be the little Bible. 66 books there, 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament, 66 books. It divides right there at that point there in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, by the time he gets to Isaiah chapter number 5, he pronounces the woes on the people there because the nation of Israel has turned against God. And it's pretty evident, if you look at that, that Isaiah now is talking about a personal experience. Before he starts to deal with the nation of Israel, after he's already rebuked them and said what he needed to say about how they're living, Isaiah went to church and it looks like he's looking for something. I don't know sometimes when people come to church what it is they're looking for, but I know in times of difficulty, problems, troubles, things like that, that we need to be able to see Jesus and need to be able to see Him clearly. And sometimes that thing gets eclipsed by whatever happens in our lifetime and we forget the focal point of why it is that we're coming to church in the first place. I'm amazed by the seraphim here. They remind me of the cherubim over in Ezekiel chapter number 1. Uh, those cherubim over there, I, I mean, it's an amazing thing. They only have four wings. They don't have six. But it's interesting that when they move, they do similarly the same things. They keep their eyes focused on the Lord. And with the wings, they cover their face, their reputation, and they cover their feet, not looking for recognition or acknowledgement of where they've been and what they're doing. I like the fact that the cherubim go about doing exactly what God tells them to do. The Bible said they go straight forward. It seems to me that when you're in fellowship with the Lord that your focus narrows down and you kind of get a little bit of tunnel vision and you recognize the importance of just being in fellowship with the Lord is more important than anything else that's going on in the world. Listen, Israel is in a mess right now. They are in a political upheaval. Uzziah the king has now died. They're looking for who's going to be the next president. Who's going to be the next king? Who's going to take the place of Uzziah, who, by the way, was a great king until he thought that he needed more than God intended for him to have. You can read all about that in, in uh, second or First Chronicles chapter number 26. I don't want to focus too much there, but Uzziah went in and usurped his authority and tried to take over. And as long as he did what God said, God blessed him. But the earmark of this particular thing is, is that the nation of Israel is in a political upheaval without anybody at the helm of the ship. And Isaiah goes and looks in the right place and is saying, Lord, what are we going to do now? And who's going to be the next appointee? And who's going to be there while the rest of the world turns maybe to the voting precinct? And maybe they turn to look at the news and maybe they look on Instagram or Snapchat or, or Facebook. And what are we going to do? Isaiah said, I know where to go and look. Under the Lord, I'll look and under his heels, I'll go. Because some things won't give you peace unless you hear from the Lord. But it's interesting, isn't it? that an earmark comes out, just like an Ebenezer stone comes out where Isaiah said, hey, I want to say that the year he died when everything was bad, when it looked like the nation of Israel was in a horrible upheaval and they had sinned and judgment was certain to come, I could still find the Lord in a time like that. It's interesting that he wasn't going there looking for answers for politics. He was looking for the Lord himself. I think it's important if the Lord uses an Old Testament prophet like that for us to pause for a moment and recognize that in the Old Testament sense, they didn't have what you have. They didn't have the priesthood of the believers. They had to be able to go through a temple. They had to be able to go through a priest. They had to be able to offer sacrifices. There's all kinds of laws and rules and things that they had to keep. And you and I don't have to do those kind of things. We have the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who's sitting up there right now, and he ever liveth and makes intercession for us. Through the Holy Spirit, I'm able to make my prayers known unto Him. But isn't it interested how, interesting how at times we get so fragmented and it's so easy to get our mind off of the main thing? Amen. Isn't it easy how quickly we think we're so spiritual and yet such little infantile small things can distract us from being the main thing and that's our fellowship with the Lord. And oftentimes we find at church what we're looking for. Because we're looking for everything but Jesus. 
Nowadays in the Old Testament and the New Testament, when the apostles after the Lord had left, they're all gathered there together and a group of individuals came in and they had heard and noised about how great it was when the Lord was there and how the ministry of the Lord was there. And you know what they came in? They said something definitive. In the last days, the same thing is said. They said, sir, we would see Jesus. It'd be nice if when people came to church, they didn't see the carpet and the pews. It's nice. It'd be nice if they didn't feel uh, the air conditioner or the nice bathrooms or uh, the nursery where we need a, a dozen more workers and those kind of things. It'd be nice if when they came to church, it's just one, one thing we're all looking for, we would see Jesus. I don't want to be that thing that gets between you and Jesus. I don't want to be a Uzziah, but I know this, I have a Uzziah that lives in me. I know at times Uzziah can rise up in me and I can take on uh, projects and I can do things that God doesn't want me to be involved in. Sometimes it's not even things that you would consider to be bad. It's just something that makes me busy. Amen. It's not sinful in nature. It's just something to get me distracted. Something to keep my mind off of what's really important. And we lose track of that time. We forget that we're living for eternity. And all of a sudden we think we're already in eternity. And whatever trouble we are in right now is going to last forever. Hey, it's only going to last until you die of the rapture. God knows exactly what it is that's going on. But all of a sudden, whatever you're going through, it eclipses Him. You're no longer to see anything. The throne is there and he's seated there and has been seated there. But something this morning has got you where you can't see Jesus anymore. Sometimes it's a bad marriage. Sorry, did I just go there? Sometimes it's financial debt. Sometimes it's sadness and grief. Sometimes it's bitterness and despair. Sometimes it is disease. Sometimes it's the unknown. Can I tell you this? He's sitting on the throne. He hasn't vacated it. He's still in that place. He knows exactly what it is that's going on. Our problem is not him. Our problem is, is we let those things, we, me and you, me on the pew, not in the pulpit, me and you, let those things get between us and him. Most important thing in your life. The greatest way to get direction is to be able to get in touch with him. I've seen the Lord show up for individuals, sometimes an old grandma up on top of a mountaintop. I've seen him show up, yes, behind a pulpit sometimes. I've seen him show up in a hospital room. I've seen him show up in a car sometimes and in an office building sometimes or under a desk sometimes. I've seen him supernaturally show up at sometimes, but sometimes because we're not looking for him, we don't see him even though it's him that's there. Credit immediately goes to something or somebody else. And Isaiah came in and he said, and I want to mark the time. Why? Because it's important for you to know when it was that I saw the Lord back in the position that he was supposed to be, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And I want to say secondly, what it did to me when I saw him. I think it's interesting that he said that the seraphim had one message. Their message wasn't talking about what all was going on and the wickedness in the nation of Israel or anything else. In the presence of God, you know all that mattered? God. Amen. You know what all they did? Holy, 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 Amen. holy, Amen. holy, holy, holy. I, they're so enamored with His holiness, with His pureness, purity, with His perfection. They're so enamored with that. It has got their full attention. It's not just the fact that I don't want you to know who I am and see who I am and that kind of a thing. That all could play into it from a real carnal standpoint. You're not going to see the Lord as long as you make it about you. We all know that, ladies and gentlemen. They're so enamored by being in the presence of God that the only thing that will utter out of their mouth is holy. Amen. Holy. And I like the fact that they're just back and forth with each other and the Lord is in between them. And they're just talking about holy. But guess what happens when he sees what they saw? That's not the first thing that man cries out. Would you agree Isaiah he must be pretty good? He's called of God. He's a prophet of God. Is that right? I mean, he is one of God's main guys in the Old Testament. He's a very well-known prophet. Wrote one of the longest books in the Bible. 66 chapters therein contained. Would you agree that he was what we would call a big dog in the day? 
And so when he shows up, it's interesting to me that the first thing he doesn't do is go, hey, me and you are good. You need to start dealing with your people. The moment that he saw God, an indicator that God has showed up is no matter how bad the political upheaval, how great the problem is, the first thing that shows up in a meeting with God is, whoa, I got a problem and it's me. Amen. Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips without the, if, well, if the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, and as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You know what Isaiah has just said? Forget about everybody else. I got a problem, and guess what? That problem has also caused me to affiliate and associate with people that are out of fellowship with you. I'm dwelling amongst the people that are not where they're supposed to be. See, that meeting with God immediately produces or creates a separation. It makes me realize that what everybody else might be concerned about, everything now changes from clods to clouds. Everything goes from terrestrial to extraterrestrial. We're now up there in the heavenlies and we're thinking, what really matters at the judgment seat of Christ? individual judgment takes place in the presence of God. Can I say this to you? Not to be too harsh with you this morning, but if we could learn to see ourselves at the judgment seat of Christ, I dare say that we would stop talking so much about what everybody else is doing because at the judgment seat of Christ, He is not going to call us in to witness against anybody else. He is not going to call us to testify to anybody else and we are not going to compare ourselves to anybody else. He is simply going to say, hey, it's your turn. And what do you think your responsibility? Well, Lord, you know, it's about stinking time. Or do you think it might be, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. I've had the wrong affiliations, the wrong associations. My eyes have wandered. My hands have wandered. My feet have wandered. My thoughts and intellect has wandered. My heart has wandered. Lord, I feel as if I'm astray. I feel like I'm abandoned. I feel like I'm outside. I'm not where I should be. I'm not. And the Lord said, well, you're here now. Now you have an opportunity. If we could grasp that, you know what you'd do? You'd cut gossip down by 90%. Amen. Because you'd realize that everything that you think is so important, ladies and gentlemen, to talk about, to discuss, that you just have to do something about, that you're so worked up about and concerned about, when eternity comes, none of that is going to matter. He's not going to ask you your opinion. He's not going to ask you for the latest report on Fox News or whatever news thing you watch. He doesn't care. It's all part of a master plan. The things that are going on in the life of us right now, literally, they're less than nothing to Him, and yet we are consumed with that. And our churches and even preachers are consumed with the here and now, and no longer the hereafter. I want to see Jesus. I want to see Him high and lifted up. Can I say that? It's to our benefit to lift him up. He's already up there. But there's something that we can do that he can't do, and that is to be able to lift him up and to give him thanks. He can't do that for himself. He relies on his creation to do that. I'm enamored by the humility of a man by the name of Isaiah. Oh, you might look at Jeremiah and call him the weeping prophet, and he certainly is. And you might look at the trouble that Isaiah, I mean, that Jeremiah went through and, and so on and so forth. Or you might pick out Ezekiel or even Elijah for that matter. But I am impressed with the fact that when he saw the Lord, the first thing he said was, me, I'm the problem. A preacher asked me one time, he said, you've preached a few places and that. And I said, yes, sir, one or two. And he said, well, he said, what's the secret to revival? I said, I'll tell you what the old preacher told me. The secret to revival is, is you go stand in a circle, draw a circle and stand in it. And you stay there until you get connected with the Lord. Until you recognize that the problem is you and not everybody else, you won't ever see revival. It doesn't matter whether or not revival breaks out in the church. I've seen revival go through a church and things start moving along pretty well and individuals sitting there in the same service and they never get the sense that God ever met with them at all. Why? Because they stepped outside the circle. We've lost the idea, the concept, that the problem oftentimes, whether we like it or not, it is us! Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. 
especially when it comes to him. Can I say this to you, ladies and gentlemen? Isaiah, if there was anybody, it's like the Apostle Paul saying, the things I shouldn't do, I do, and the things I should do, uh, that I do not. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body? Because I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelling no good thing. Paul saying that 27 years after salvation. And you know what he's saying? He's saying, I still got a problem with me. Yeah. You know what I see consistently through the Bible? That people that were close to the Lord on a regular basis, you know what they do? They keep thinking they're the problem. It's almost an indicator that the whole key to seeing the Lord is to recognize you and I are the problem. It's not the world in which we live. It's not the earth upon which we dwell. It's not the ship in which we sail or the plane in which we fly in. The problem is those of us that are saved individuals have gotten Him off the throne. And we don't see Jesus like we used to see Jesus because, hey, the problem is the world and the economy and the wickedness and the queers and the AIs and all those things. Hey, the devil doesn't care as long as your eyes aren't on him. Amen. Amen. But a real meeting with Jesus, the first thing it does is it causes a heart-wrenching, oh, I am problem. And because I have a problem, I've started running with people that are like me. And you look in that passage right there, and when the seraphim began to come around there, he said, I'm undone. Mine eyes have seen the king. I, 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 honestly, I cannot, whew, I cannot wait for him to completely fill my everything. Peripheral vision. Not just physically, but between my little brain. To have an all-consuming God just fill everything and every bout of thing about me. Be so large it pushes everything else out. Amen. I can't wait to have singleness of mind. I'm not interested in how many thoughts or ideas or how many things contrary I can come up with so I can establish myself as some kind of a theologian. I'm not interested in that. I want to be one-minded and one-brained. I think that is the epitome of peace. Yes. Yes. Is to say, man... What are you thinking about? I'm thinking about the Lord. Amen. I'm thinking about God sure is good. Amen. I'm thinking about what a blessing He allows me to breathe and how come He left me down here to testify for Him. And one day I'm going home to be with Him in glory and have my head fixed and have my body fixed. And until that time, I'm going to do my eyes, do my best to keep my eyes fixed on Him. Amen. He said, man, I'm a mess. Yes. Isaiah, you're a mess? Look at the people that are around you. You're so much better than them. You're so much better than the Catholics and the Charismatics and the Church of Christ and all the cults and all the people that are around. I mean, you go to church. I mean, it reminds me of the Pharisee who says, Thank God I'm not like that publican over there with his head bowed and banging on his chest. I go and fast twice a week and get over and above the tithe. Yeah, but you ain't seeing Jesus. And the Lord looks down on the other individual and says, that guy, him, I'll, he'll see Jesus. Look what happens in the passage in the interest of time. I'll not take too long, but notice what he says. He says this in verse number 6. After he gets right and not till he gets right. Do you see that? Does he get a message from the Lord? It's one thing to see him. It's another thing to hear from him. Amen. Seeing him doesn't do anything but humble you and realize what a gnat you are. But having him talk to you. Having him speak to you. Having him say, I, I, I have a message for you. I have something I, I'd like to tell you. And send one of those seraphim over there. And he takes a pair of tongs. And he takes up that hot coal from off that, uh, that altar. And even though Isaiah is cleaner than most, he's already said he's a man of unclean lips. Am I right? Am I in the Bible? You know what he does? The first thing he addresses is those unclean lips. He takes a hot coal from off the altar. And he goes over there and what, I don't know about you, but most people run from fire. And you're wise to run from fire. And they're fighting fires out there just uh, a little bit west of Amarillo. And they've had it burn all kind of other stuff up there. And, and it's a huge mess and those kind of things. And people are trying to get away from it. I remember the little boy out in the projects in Blodgett Homes. And 
around court C or D back there. And uh, I remember getting there and I got there before rescue and I, I, I saw this little boy. He came out and it looked like he had, remember those old dishwashing gloves that you put on ladies and get them just about to your elbows? That little boy was standing there like this, a little black fellow there, and he's standing there, and it looked like somebody had peeled that skin down, and it was dangling off the end of his fingers, and he was standing there, and all over the top of him up here, and he was screaming. Every time the wind would just, the slightest breeze would blow, he would scream like a Comanche Indian. And he had gotten up there when the crab bowl was going, and when it got good and hot, and he grabbed a hold of that little spoon that was sticking out of there, and he wanted to look up there and see and it burned him. We built a little, took one of those foil blanket things and built a little circle around him and tried to get him over there as best we could and got him there when rescue got there. He couldn't lay down. He couldn't sit down. Just scream and you say, why? Fire hurts. Sometimes fire can leave permanent scars. You remember when you got burned Sometimes because of developing scar tissue. My wife pulled some divinity candy over on top of her when she was a little girl. Divinity candy is where you take like a Cairo syrup and you heat it up until it boils. It boils at 300 and something degrees and she was trying to get it off to cool it and it spilled over on her and spilled all over and that kind of thing. And you say, well, well, what happened? Uh, years of debriding and, and surgeries and all kind of other things. You know what? There's still scars to this day from that because you remember when you get burned. Do you remember the last time the Lord burned you? Because burning also purifies you. See, before the Lord can use Isaiah to do something else he wants him to do. He says, you know something, even for you, old preacher, you need a cleansing. Amen. There's something in your personal life that's not where it ought to be. Isn't that the truth nowadays? Amen. Haven't you gotten kind of commonplace in your relationship with the Lord? And, and because you're better than most and you don't do the thing, but just things slipping, just, you know, just a little bit, just you know, your tongue slipping just a little, your thoughts slipping just a little. And your jokes slipping just a little. Your dietary habits slipping just a little. I don't mean keeping the shrimp and scales and all that other kind of stuff I'm talking about. You're kind of letting things slip in there now that you know you shouldn't. But after all, it's a special time of year and a little bit of wine. And, you know, I mean, everybody else does it. And all of a sudden, your convictions begin to kind of go the way of the American Indian. And you kind of begin to make fun of anybody that has any sort of standard at all. Now all of a sudden, church becomes just a, a joke. It's just a place for parties and hurry up and get done so we can go out. Isaiah's having the proverbial come to meeting, uh, come to Jesus meeting. You know what he says to that seraphim? He said, go over there and get that. Back there, if you ever come by my office and you're welcome to, you'll see there, there's a stand there that a fellow made me. Stands about that high. It's got a pair of tongs on it. It has this verse on there. Isaiah chapter number 6, with the tongs from off the altar. You say, why? Because the right kind of message sometimes, it winds up burning you, it cauterizes you. Yeah. Amen. One of the ways that they used to heal up individuals that had infection was, is they burned them, realizing that the scar would be permanent, but it was better than dying from the infection. Yes, sir. That's good. And he took those tongs and he got a coal from off the altar and he took them in his hand and he went up there and he burned his lip. Do you realize that sometimes when you meet with God, it's not just seeing him and the excitement of seeing him, but you realize sometimes a meeting with God is like salt being poured into the wound and sometimes you need that purification. You need that cleanliness. You need to embrace that. You know what most people would do nowadays when the Lord through the power of the Holy Spirit puts you under real conviction? You know what the attitude is nowadays? We run like a scalded dog. We're scared to death. We had someone that came here to visit with us not long ago. It wasn't my intention. I don't even remember what it was I preached on. But as he was leaving out of the door, he said, that looks like that guy's mad or upset about something like that. I'm not used to having a preacher talk that kind of way to me. I'll not be back. Okay. Did you get burned? I mean, it might have left a little scar tissue, but 
ounce of prevention better than a pound of cure. That's not being said to make it sound like anything that I am. I'm simply saying to you that sometimes you forget that meeting with God requires there to be a, a removal of things that are displeasing to Him. And sometimes it hurts, but thank God there's scar tissue because it blocks infection from getting back in. Sometimes when you get burned really, really bad, it prevents you from putting your hand back on the stove again. See, what happened? Man, I got burned when I was a kid. I put my hand on the stove. When's the last time you did that? Oh, I ain't never done that again. Sometimes one of the ways that God shows His grace is He allows you to get caught. You say, why? To burn you. To see how you'll handle being burned. Don't wait to get caught. That's not the time to beg for mercy. The time to beg for mercy is before you get caught and ask God to forgive you and try to keep your hind end out of trouble. You say, why? Don't get burned. But it's a lot of times, you know what you do? You come to church or you read your Bible or you study, you pray, and you're getting burned all the time. You say, why? The Lord doesn't burn anything that's good. He burns the things that are bad. Amen. The first thing that happened with Isaiah is after he confessed his condition, the Lord said, well, I got a message for you. And it's not a great message in the sense of exalting you and lifting you up, Isaiah. He said, uh, I need to cleanse you. If you're here today and you're lost, you know what you have to understand? If you're lost, you're on the way to hell. You know how long you're going to die? How long you're going to burn? You're going to burn forever. You say, why? You can't purify yourself well enough. You'll burn forever until God dies. Why not take somebody that took that for you? Well, that's not a real positive message, preacher. That's the most positive message it can be. Amen. Somebody will take my place and burn in hell for me. Yeah, he did. He took your place on Calvary's cross so you didn't have to go there and pay the penalty for it. Yeah, that's a positive message. Yeah, but preacher, it hurts. Sure it hurts. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Does that not hurt? Yeah, it burns. Amen. You know what's, what burns? What burns is, that Bible says, if we say we have no sins, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, you say, what is He telling you? Sometimes you have to admit, I got to get burned. And when the Lord's coming at you with those hot tongs and that hot coal off the altar, you know what you have to be willing to do? You have to be willing to run to it, to embrace it, not run away from it. Amen. God's doing this old boy a favor. And right after He delivers that message... And this goes along with what Brother Anderson was saying. Can you imagine a woman with a voice like that who could have the ability to literally travel all around the United States and sing every Sunday if she wanted to and get an offering, an honorarium or whatever, and get an offering for singing the way God's hands on her. You can definitely tell that. It's been on her for years, right? She could travel around and do that. She's down there in Papua New Guinea without all the benefit of nice pianos and nice speaker systems and all the other stuff, without making CDs and without being on YouTube and without getting all the introduction and stuff. You you say, well, what do you think about that preacher? I think she's doing what God told her to do. Amen. The bigger issue is, are you? Amen. Yeah, but preacher, she could do so much here. Yeah, but see, the problem is, is you don't you view things the way he does. Right. But you know what he said? He said, hey, if you can help us out, that'd be good. And not just giving, but going. You want to come over? Oh, we'll clear it with the pastor, but... <laughs> We can put you to work. Skilled or unskilled, we'll take you. But you have to be willing to meet with the Lord yet. And sometimes what He'll do is change your plans. He'll alter your future. He'll change your language. And have you to be able to speak for Him as opposed to speaking for whatever it is that you've chosen to do. He'll change the direction in your life. We're coming to that. You see, a meeting with God wasn't just a hallelujah revival meeting. It wasn't just to come to Jesus meeting and getting cleaned up and fixed up and then going back out. It was now that I'm cleaned up and fixed up, the Lord said, I I'm looking for a man. I need somebody. And Isaiah's, well, send him. I mean, all these other people are here. Send one of them. I got a job, Lord. That's not what he said. Are you reading the passage? You know what he said? 
the first utterance he has after having his lips cleaned? How, how about me? S send me. Let me go. Let me do it. Would you, would you let me do it? I mean, like those seraphim are doing what you want them to do? Can I be like that? But you'll never surrender that way until you've been cleansed. Until you've been permanently scarred. Until you recognize that the fire of the Lord has now touched you in a way that He doesn't touch everybody. And I'm not talking about the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and speaking with other tongues. All that does is make you think you're something nobody else is. I'm talking about the willingness and humbleness to be willing to submit yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. Send me. Can I say this? That came after his confession. Came after his cleansing. Can we use that? The calling doesn't come until after the confession and the cleansing. Preacher, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? I don't know, but the willingness is the key ingredient. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Send me to where? Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's send me back home to be a better husband. Send me back home to be a better wife. Send me back to be more involved in the local church you've had me affiliated with. Send me to the jail. Send me to the prison. Send me to the juvenile. Send me, Lord. Here I am. Use me to make a batch of cookies. To wash a pot, to change a toilet paper roll, to scrub a toilet. Here I am. Use me. Send me. Let me. Can I say this? That the Lord took him up on his offer? Do you see that? But what he had him do was not popular. He said, I'm against these people because Isaiah, they won't distinguish themselves like you have. They're not interested in me. They're interested in my hand, Isaiah. They're not interested in my face. They want me to always be doing something for them instead of seeing me for who and what I am. They don't see it as a privilege, an honor to serve me. They've reversed the roles. And they think they're doing me a favor to serve me. Isaiah, you go to them because I'm done with them. I'm through. We know because we're saved and eternally secure that the Lord can't kick us out of heaven. But he can sure break fellowship. Yes. I look in that thing and I think to myself, man, I'd like to see Jesus. And the Lord said to me, you sure you want to see me? If Isaiah was dirty, how about you? I'm like, oh, whoa, well, hold on a minute. I'm not so sure I really want to see you that bad. Can I say this? I guarantee you that Isaiah's profession, although shortened in your Bible... He completely drained the dregs of what all he had done in front of the Lord before the Lord burned him up there with a message. Would you be willing to do that? I mean, if you saw the Lord. Would you be willing to come down and say, Lord, I know I've been shacking up. And I know it's wrong. And I'm quitting right now today. You don't want to be that clean, do you? It burned, didn't it? Lord, today I'm going to... You can fill in the blank. I have no idea. I can make a list of 100 and leave yours out. You'll be like, hey, I'm doing pretty good. Check the list, check the list. Multiple choice, I'm doing pretty good. I mean, only three of the four things he touched me. But the Holy Spirit knows exactly what it is. I could use a whole lot of things to try to armbar you or guilt trip you and those kind of things. But the bottom line is, reason we don't see Jesus is because we don't like the initial contact. 
We'd rather just see him. We don't want him to touch us. And after he touches us, we don't want him to speak to us. I'm petrified of the Lord taking his hand off of me. Amen. How do you know the Lord's hand's on you? You wouldn't understand. Amen. I know me. And I know that I'm not able to do what I do if it wasn't for him it is not main strength and offeredness. It's not discipline. It's not that. It's because God has put His hand on me for whatever the reason might be. And I'm scared to death of Him taking His hand off of me. But you know what scares me even more so? For Him to stop talking to me. To have that communion so twisted, so broken, my spiritual ears so full of wax that the Lord high and lifted up and oh, I see Him and He comes to me and He's like, man, Lord, that burns. And He's like, but I ain't talking to you. You say, why? Because you're not listening anymore. The Bible says in the last days that there is a famine in the land and it is not for preaching. The famine in the land is for hearers of the Word of God. In the last days, the Bible said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will come and open, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. But we find him outside the door, not just of the church, outside the doors of our heart. You say, why? We don't really want him to touch us and we can't stand it when he talks to us. We're so far removed from where he used to be, enamored in His presence, enamored when God would speak, enamored when God would breathe on here and speak to us, speak to us through a song or through a sermon or through a sermon. And boy, God would just move and we would be so enamored with it and willing to do anything. Amen. Now it's, we're very conservative and might I even say extremely careful. Let's don't get too carried away. Oh, I long for the days when I saw Jesus and I was like, I don't care, man. I just want to serve Him. I just want to follow Him. I just want to be behind Him. Oh, I was a bull in a china closet. I was an idiot. I mean, listen, I would get up to get gone and go for two year, two hours and strip my gears out. But man, I mean to tell you, God was doing something and I was willing to be burnt slap up. But now it's like, well, Lord, I... You know, got a couple people now and got to be a, a little bit more sophisticated and, and much more careful and, and, and you know, kind of turn it down. No, I, I don't want to turn it down. Amen. Amen. I'm not talking about volume. Amen. I am talking about an intensity. Amen. Isaiah is in the sixth book, sixth chapter. He's got 60 more chapters to write. Did you just get it? What do you think would have happened to those other 60 chapters if he hadn't have got six right? You might have read a six chapter book. But because he was willing to get right, he got the wax blown out of his ears and the calluses off of his heart. And all of a sudden, guess what? He could feel God's presence again. You remember how that was? Do you remember how when you, when you came to church, you just, I mean, it didn't matter. Somebody could get up and say, Mary had a little lamb. You'd be like, oh, and what a lamb it was. And man, you'd be off and running. You wouldn't be talking about hermeneutics and homiletics and three points and a poem and all. You'd just be like, whoo, what'd you do? I went and heard about Jesus today. Mary had a little lamb. Boy, its fleece was white as snow. Everywhere Mary with a lamb was sure to go. Let's talk about the lamb. And you'd be excited. And it didn't have to be perfect. It was just about Jesus. But time rolls on. And hearts grow harder. And brains go fuller. And before long, we no longer desire, we want to see Him. And Uzziah is very much alive today. He lives and breathes in our own flesh and in our own churches. It's not that the Lord doesn't want in. It's that He's here, but Uzziah keeps us from seeing Him. Isaiah said, Lord, I want to do some things. He gives him some prophetic stuff. A big portion of Isaiah is prophetic. 
But can I say this? You lose your desire for future things, for prophetic things, if you haven't had the right meeting with the Lord first. You're not interested in what God thinks. You're not interested in what God says. You don't care about what's going to happen at the judgment seat. It's so far away and such a distant time period. Oh, everything else becomes important. And before you know it, you're not a bad person. Can I say that? You're better than most. Can I say that? But before long, church is not what church used to be. Preaching is not what preaching used to be. And singing is not what singing used to be. And prayer certainly is not what prayer used to be. It all becomes a facilitator for the earthly instead of the heavenly. And before long, without us even knowing, the coals have grown cold. And you get down and you breathe on those embers as hard as you can and no flame. One of the greatest tests in the Christian life is when God says things contrary to you to give you an opportunity to see Him, to feel Him, and to hear from Him. But Isaiah had to follow the steps. Problem's me. Problem's the company I'm keeping. I got a message for you, Isaiah. Hot. Burns. Now that we got that squared away, I'm looking for somebody. You know what you would think? You would think if you look at that story that Isaiah thought he was the only one in church. You know when God deals with you, you know how you feel like the Holy Spirit singled you out and you've got all these other people around you and the Holy Spirit said, hey, you. Don't tell me there weren't other people in the throne room when Nathan came in and said, thou art the man. David said, I know who he's talking to. How about you? Have you paused to think about that? Have you considered how far away you've gotten and you didn't come to church anymore looking for Jesus? Looking for whatever else? When was the last time you felt that burn, that conviction? Your heart burned because God moved in and the love of God just spoke to you. David said, the goodness of God leadeth me to repentance. And you're just moved by how good God's been to let us breathe His air. How good God's been. Why wouldn't I want to be right with somebody like that? We almost make Him out to be a bad father when trouble comes our way as if He's done something we didn't deserve and He's a bad father for letting it happen. Isaiah got up a changed man. Isaiah got busy doing what God wanted him to do, write another 60 chapters. I'd love to finish like that. I'd like to be like Moses and finish going up the mountain against gravity. I'd like to be like Paul. I finished my course. I kept the faith. Henceforth, it laid to me a crown of righteousness for all them that love is apparent. I'd love to be able to finish like Jesus Christ when he said, it's finished. I've done everything I'm supposed to do. But I know this. I know without seeing him. I know without him touching me. He ain't going to talk to me. And if he don't talk to me, I'm going to lose direction. And I'm going to lose my fellowship. And therefore, I still go to heaven when you do. But I never get that position of saying, Lord, can you use me? Listen, I'm almost done. Tomorrow, you know what will happen? You'll be cutting somebody's fur tomorrow. And they'll be in the chair and the Holy Spirit will say, I'm looking for a man. <coughs> Lord, here I am. Tell that man about the Lord. Tell him about me. Uh, don't give him anything uh, uh, hugely scriptural. Just tell him what I've done for you personally, Mitch. Could you do that for me? The Lord's looking for a man. The Lord's looking for a woman. You say what? To always be available. It may not be Papua New Guinea. You may not ever be able to cross that 24-hour plane ride over there. 
You may not ever see those kinds of things. But I guarantee you every day, you know what the Lord says? I need them then. Can you do what I need you to do today? Can you pray today? I need a man. You say, well, it takes a man to do that. Amen. It takes real commitment to do that. It takes a real willingness to be pleasing to God. You can't do it to please other people. Other people are not looking whether you read or don't read. You're not doing it for that. You're doing it to please Him. Why? He needs a man. Yes. God knows we need a man nowadays. And I don't mean somebody that can settle an argument with their fists. I mean somebody that can humbly say, Lord, here I am, send me, give me whatever task you want me to do, I'll, I'll do it, I don't care. I'm, <laughs> give me a broom, give me a shovel, give me a hammer, give me a Bible, I don't, I don't care. Hand me a sawmill, give me a rag. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.